Hello again, and thank you so much for joining us, whether you're here live and in person or you're joining us online, whether you're just watching independently or you're watching as one of our Rockfish Church gatherings. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We are kicking off a brand new series entitled Unordinary, the art actually of being unordinary. Now, God calls us, how God calls us to break the mold, and I think that's very important. Now, this is a four-part series. The first portion of the series is going to consist of how we stand out. What does that look like? Then we're going to talk about serve next week. And then there's going to be an interesting uh, aspect that we're going to look at called stand up. If you're going to be different, if you're going to be extra or unordinary, there comes a point where you're going to have to stand up in order to stand out. And then we're going to look at a very popular topic of suffering at the end of this particular sermon series. So somebody's going, hey, Pastor Tony, do you know something we don't know? I hope not. Anyway, I want everybody to know. So let's look at stand out today. If there's one thing that we've seen in our culture, people really want to stand out. People do some crazy stuff, in fact, to stand out or to get noticed. You know, I was reading a statistic on on loneliness the other day. Even though there's more people on the face of this earth than have ever existed, we're surrounded by more people, inundated by more people, loneliness is at an all-time high. Think about that. People are more lonely now with more people than they've ever been in the, in the history of humanity. Now, following God in our culture can, can cause you to stand out and most likely will cause you to stand out because you're going to look different if you are following God effectively. Now, I think this is kind of something that God kind of built into Christianity. Now, when it comes to standing out, there was a man, his name was John, and he really stood out. I want to look at him for just a moment. Many of you are familiar with John the Baptist. Matthew 3, 1 through 4 tells us a little bit about John the Baptist. So let's jump in here. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair. He had a leather belt around his waist and his food was locust and wild honey. For us, a locust, just so you know, is a grasshopper, a big grasshopper. So how did he stand out? He stood out in in three very powerful ways that I think that we can learn a little bit from today. Number one, he stood out because he had a very clear message. What was John's message? Repent and prepare the way. He was saying, guys, I need you to get ready. Prepare the way. Something is happening now that has never happened before, and you do not want to miss this this, this, uh, this moment. Uh, Very often in our culture, things are not clear. Even in his day, things were not clear. You heard all of these jumbled messages and these different voices and these different opinions were were inundating the, the, the Jewish culture. Just as today... A clear message stands out. People are so wishy-washy and unclear, and and everybody's opinion is is elevated to the place of fact, and we're supposed to respect and believe that, and it causes mass confusion and chaos. His message was clear, as our message should be clear as well. He also had a clear call to action. He was like, guys, the kingdom of heaven is near. It's right here. Now you need to do something. You need to respond in a certain way. In fact, when he, when he called to the Pharisees of that particular day, he said, not only do you need to prepare your hearts and get ready and repent, but you need to do things actionably that are consistent with that repentance. In other words, he's saying, guys, look, you just saying I'm sorry is not enough. You need to, to show the fruit or the results of a heart that has really changed its course and its trajectory. Very important. And the other thing that he did is he gave a very clear reason. This is huge. What was his reason? His reason, he said, was because the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Here's what he was saying. He was saying, guys, I know you've heard about this, and and the priests have talked about this, but that moment is right here, right now. He was saying, no longer is the kingdom of heaven something that's far off and unattainable. It is right here, and repentance and preparation is the way for you to engage in that. Think about this for a moment. Here's what he's saying compared to us right now. This room 
is absolutely full. It could not be more full of salvation than it is right now at this moment. Here's, think about this. He was saying the kingdom of God is at hand. So right now, the reality is that this room is chock full of salvation. And anybody, through belief in the word and trust in faith, can reach out and procure that availability right now, this very moment. The Bible says that, that today is the day of salvation. This is what he was saying. And this is what the world needed to hear at that time. And I believe it's what the world needs to hear now. It's what makes us unordinary. That we're not talking about something that is not available, but that something that is apparent and available right here and right now to every single person. It's kind of like electricity. Electricity has always been here. Nobody really knows what it is. Isn't that interesting? People, scientists don't know what electricity is. But it's here. It's always been available, but it's not been utilized to light the things and run the cameras and do what we're doing. Salvation is here, but we tap into it by faith. He was saying, guys, for the first time, the kingdom of God is here. Our message, world, salvation and hope and redemption and help is here and it's available. So he had a clear message. He had a clear call to action to repent. And he had a clear reason for doing it. Now, some other aspects were that he wore some strange clothes. He dressed a little funny. Can you imagine? Now, I know that we think of John the Baptist as, as like this, this biblical character. But imagine you walk up to him and he's wearing a, a camel. I can imagine that people would say, is that my camel? You know, because they used to ride camels back then. So that means that he probably killed a camel, ate a camel, and now he's wearing a camel. And, you know, you walk up and it has a spot and you're going, is that my camel? Anyway, anyway. So, so, and he had this big leather belt. Now, the Bible points this out because it says he dressed a little differently. He, he behaved a little differently. It says that his diet, now why would it include his diet? His diet consisted of, of locusts or grasshoppers and wild honey. He, he lived off the land. Can you imagine talking to, uh, talking to an old boy and you walk up and, and John, who obviously was, a, was a, a pretty choleric fella, you walk up and you're talking to him and, and, and you're distracted. Have you ever been talking to somebody who has a beard and, and when they're, they've got a piece of food stuck in their beard and, you're trying, and, and John's talking, he's going to the kingdom of heaven and, and you're looking and you see this thing hanging off the side of his and it starts to kick and you realize there's a grasshopper leg hanging off. Do I tell him? You don't say anything to John. You don't say anything to John. You just let John talk, and, and you look, and you're going, there's a grasshopper leg hanging out of old boy's mouth. I mean, you know, this is real. This is how real this was. So we know what his diet consisted of. We know why, why he dressed that way. And people say, well, why did he dress that way? Well, maybe he gave more time to seeking and being and experiencing God than he did to the things that the culture gave their time to, which is why they didn't experience and know what John knew at that moment. Just think about that for a little bit. But a lot of people in the Bible have stood out for various reasons. We talk about Noah. Noah had to be one strange fellow. He's building a boat. It had never rained. That's kind of strange. How about, how about uh, Elijah and Elisha? These, these gentlemen, they really stood out. Do you realize that people must have been terrified of Elijah and Elisha? Remember at one point in the Bible, this army comes and says, Hey, uh, Elijah, the king wants to talk to you. Come down, old man of God, and talk to him. And, 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 and he's like, uh, zap. Struck match. They all looked like a bunch of... He killed them. Right then he said, let fire come down from heaven and consume you. And it did. And so they sent another group. By the time the third group came, old boy's like, please, don't smote us. Don't smote... Whatever that King James... Don't kill us. These were individuals that stood out a little bit. And this is our heritage. This is our lineage. I think the church should stand in awe, or the world should stand in awe at the real power and presence of God in the church. Unfortunately, I feel as though what is referred to in the Bible as Ichabod has occurred. The presence of God has, has departed, and yet maybe we're still kind of going through the motions and the actions. And God is saying, people, let me back in. I want you to be that peculiar, that unordinary people that I've called you and destined you and equipped you to be. But something needs to happen in order for that to happen in our lives. So let's look, before we look at what unordinary looks like, let's look at what ordinary looks like for just a, uh, just a moment. Romans 12 and 2 says something incredibly important. It says, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. Why? Because we're not of this world. 
Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. I remember I went to Honduras recently. Actually, I've been to several countries over the last six or eight months and realized that when I get there, if I don't change the way I'm thinking, I could run into problems very, very quickly. And this is exactly what God is saying here. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world because you're not of this world. We are citizens of the kingdom of God, which operates under very, very different principles. But let God transform you into what you need to be in order to operate in this world successfully by changing the way you think. We're thinking about this all wrong. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So in order for us to be unordinary here, it means we need to be ordinary citizens of the kingdom of God. What does an ordinary citizen of this world look like? What's ordinary? Grumbling and complaining. You know, there, there's a particular verse in the Bible where God was talking to the, the children of Israel as they were traversing. They were baptized in the Red Sea, and then they went into the wilderness, and they were supposed to take a very short trip to the promised land. But there was a couple of things, grumbling and complaining, that hindered them. It says God was not pleased with them. He was angry at them because instead of it being a very short, short trip, it became a very long trip. What happens when you, when you experience adversity? When you run into bad situations like the children of Israel, they were baptized, they all come through the Red Sea, they're in the wilderness, they're going, but God was unpleased because of their, for several reasons that he gets into. And I want to look at, at some of this. Three things about grumbling and complaining. If you grumble and complain... Whatever situation you're in, you can guarantee you're going to stay in it longer. Let me tell you why. The children of Israel, because of their grumbling and complaining and unbelief, they all died in the, in the wilderness. They, weren't, they didn't have to. But they chose unbelief as opposed to belief. So three things about grumbling, grumbling and complaining. And again, I, I, stay with me. I'm going to move quickly through this. Don't get offended. It is a front to the sovereignty of God. When things come into your life, you have to understand if you're grumbling and complaining, you're complaining against God. He knew what was going to happen. It says that he, he tested them in the wilderness, and their response was grumbling and complaining. When adversity comes into your life or your marriage or your relationships with your children, are you busy grumbling and complaining? Because I can guarantee you you're going to stay in that situation a lot longer. That's the way the world behaves. That's normal. That's not our ordinary it's the ordinary of this world. How about this one? It's an accusation against the goodness of God. And you hear people say it all the time. Well, if God was good or something bad happens and we begin to question his goodness towards us. When very often he allows these things in our lives to develop his image in us. Do you understand he's more concerned about your conformity than he is your comfort? He's more concerned about your character than he is your comfort. Why? Because you, as, as citizens of the eternal kingdom, you live forever. This is just a very small portion. You need good character in order to be a good citizen of the kingdom of heaven, which is eternal. That's why you can't fake this thing. That's why it's not about just putting on a little show while you're here. We need real transformation, eternally lasting and obvious transformation that will show and shine through eternity. Because every one of you are going to exist for eternity somewhere. You've got a few years left here before you're launched into that. How about this third one? So the, the first one, it's an affront to the sovereignty of God, grumbling and complaining, which is ordinary in this world. It is an accusation against the goodness of God, which is often prevalent in this world. And it is an expression of unbelief towards God. It says they were, he was angry at their grumbling and complaining because it was an expression of unbelief. Listen, God says he causes all things to work together for good. He's given us that clear, underwritten word. God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him or are called according to his purpose. If you are a believer, he loves you. You've been called according to his purpose. Your life is underwritten and you are guaranteed that now or in eternity, it will work together for your good. Anything other than that that causes you to grumble and complain is an expression of unbelief. You say, well, Pastor Tony, that's hard. No, it's just true. I'm sick of being in the mold of this world. And in order to take on the mold of the next world, sometimes this mold must be crushed. That's why he said your mind must be transformed. We've got to put off our conforming attitude and mindset that makes us like everybody else here intentionally and take on that mindset of the kingdom as opposed to the temporal. So what's ordinary? Arguing and fighting. 
This is normal. If you don't know Christ and you don't walk in, in the spirit of God, your life is going to be full of arguing and fighting, and that is absolutely normal. But not every living room has to look that way. Where the presence of God is, there should be peace. There should be the ability to, to quiet your flesh and not have to return that evil for evil. There should be the ability to drop a matter and let it go. That's what we've been given. I, I know that's not normal. I know it's not ordinary. It's incredibly, un, in, incredibly unordinary. But it's what this world does. So let's look at three motivations for conflict that motivate the children of this world but should never motivate us. Are you ready? Number one, or there's actually four of them. This last one was so good I had to add it. Listen to this. Number one, biggest motivation or one of the motivations for conflict is selfishness. Very often we fight because we don't get our way. Well, he didn't do what I thought he should do. Or they were nasty to me. I didn't get my way. Yeah, I got it. You're selfish. Stop it. Huge. But, 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 but that's not us. Love is the antithesis of selfishness, but it is ordinary to be selfish in this world as a citizen of this world. How about this one? Another big motivator for conflict. Number one, selfish. Number two, pride. How many times, guys, I'm talking to you. How many times has somebody says something to you and it's like, well, it wasn't that you said that. It's that they saw you say that. Now I got to punch you in the throat. It's true. Our pride gets, you at the gas station pumping gas and somebody says something about you. And next thing you know, you're rolling around in the parking lot or you done shot somebody. Your pride, our pride gets us into these situations because pride is always associated with perception. And there should be only one perception that we're concerned with. Whose is it? Is it our wives or our children or our buddies? No, it should be God's. That is unordinary in this world. Man, I got in a lot of trouble because of that one. You remember, what was it, Back to the Future? Remember the Back to the Future series? If, y'all don't, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to grow up. But he would always get in trouble because somebody would call him chicken. And he'd be like, you can't call me chicken. It was like in elementary school when he said, your mama. Don't you talk about my mama, I'll kill you. You got to defend your mama because of your pride. You, you see, you say, well, Pastor Tony, am I not supposed to defend my mama? And no, you're not. She's, trust me, she'd beat you anyway, and you're probably mad at her and probably said a lot worse stuff about her than they ever would. Come on. All right, I'm sorry. Too much coffee this morning. All right, how about this? So selfishness, pride, ambition. Ambition. Man, it leads to arguments and fightings because we want to get ahead. We can get so jealous that somebody else is going to take the focus off us and we're going to miss an opportunity. Let me, let me save your life right now. Opportunity comes from one place. It comes from God. God provides opportunity. You please him and let him worry about the opportunities. I don't care where you are. You care where you work, what you do. You honor God and he will honor you. I promise you. Test him. See. He's good. And number, number four, <laughs> and this is a big one, and I, I think we... This is normal in this world, should not be normal with us because we should, we, should kick, kick, we should beat this one on the front end. In fact, Wednesday night, I'm going to talk about this one, beating this on the front end. But it's frustration. And very often, frustration comes into our lives and we operate out of frustration and it causes arguments and fights because we're operating in anxiety that we were never supposed to operate in the first place. If your life is filled with anxiety and fear, you need to listen this coming Wednesday night. I got a message for you, okay? I was going to do it as a panel, but there was way too much information. And it's information that I believe you need to have. Listen, fear and frustration is not supposed to dictate our lives. That is the normal in this world. That's why you see people with... This is not what we are called to. It is ordinary to the citizens of the earth, but not ordinary to us because God has called us to be unordinary. So what does unordinary look like? It looks like unity. You understand that one of the things that we ask, one of the prerequisites for being a member of Rockfish Church is that you preserve the unity of the church. Why? Because unity is so uncommon. Why? Because all of those things that I just mentioned. Every one of those are designed to break unity. The deciding, one of, the, one of the, 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 the hallmarks of Christianity is unity. John 17, 20 and 23. Let me read something to you. This is going to blow your mind. It says, my prayer. Now, this is Jesus praying for you. My prayer is not for them alone. This is the way he starts the prayer. But I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Every one of us believe in God because of, one of, the, message, because of the message of one of the people that was standing there, right there at that moment. 
they heard the gospel, they shared it. And somehow, some way, our lives were affected. So he said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for this who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one in unity. Father, just as you and me, uh, just as you are in me and I am in you. That's amazing. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Our unity persuades the world of the, of the fact that the Father sent the Son. You say, how does that work? Did you hear what he just said? He said, let their unity be proof that you sent me. Our lives become evidence as we walk in unity that the Father sent the Son. It gets even better. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and I have loved them as you have loved me. Our unity validates Jesus and his coming from the Father. Our unity validates and proves enough to condemn this world the love that God has for us. The world will be judged because we through the unity that we have, represent God enough for him to judge the whole world according to this, world, to this word. Think about that. There's enough evidence and proof of the existence of God through the unity that we have because it is so opposed to what the world doesn't have. So what is, un what is unordinary about us? Unity, number one. Number two, love. Love is massively unordinary. A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so must you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you stand out, that you are my disciples. How? If you love one another. The validity of the reality of you as a citizen of the kingdom of God is exemplified and proven to all humanity through the love that you do or you do not walk in because it is the antithesis of the behavior of this world. It is just that unordinary. So unity, love, and forgiveness. Let me read this to you. Colossians 3.13 says, bear with one another and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive how? As the Lord forgave you. Pastor Tony, why do we talk about forgiveness so often? All right. Is there anybody here who in the last 90 days has not had to forgive somebody for doing something stupid? Just raise your hand. I, I want to see. For those of you online who have not raised your hand either, guys, that's why. Because we are constantly faced in this world. The Bible says that, that many will be offended in the last days. A Christian should be the hardest person to offend on the face of the earth. We should, it should be impossible for us to get offended and stumble because of somebody else's behavior. Think about how massive, how massive a earmark of Christianity that this is. This is why I talk about it. Because it is something that if you don't face today, you'll probably face tomorrow. And if you're not facing it, somebody's probably facing it because of you. But Pastor Tony, I don't do anything wrong. Yeah, and they didn't think they did either. But it still hurt your little sensitive feelings, didn't it? Ooh. Yo, sensitive thing. Oh, I don't like what they did. They hurt my feelings. Forget your feelings. Start walking by faith. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, now let's look at this. Here's why this is important. It's going to blow your mind. Are you ready? This, this is, I'm, I'm going to go through this in about two minutes. Forgiveness is functional preservation of unity. You will never have unity unless you intentionally walk in forgiveness. I promise you, you won't have unity at your home. You won't have unity at your work. You won't have unity at your church unless you, unless you continually and habitually and intentionally walk in forgiveness and mercy towards people. Yes, so they did it. Yes, so they meant it. Yes, so they were mean. You act like forgiveness is optional. Can I give you a scripture for that? If you don't forgive, your Father in heaven won't forgive you. Oh, but Pastor Tony, surely that couldn't mean me. Yeah, it means you. <laughs> I read it in the Greek. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Forgiveness is functional preservation of unity. This is how we keep unity. Unity is broken when? When in offense. Just forgive the fool. Just forgive them. It's called mercy. Number two, forgiveness is observable evidence of love. 
You say, well, I'm loving. Well, why are you mad at your wife? You say, I'm loving. Well, why are you mad at your husband? Why don't you just forgive them? You act like you're perfect. Guys, can, can I get newsflash? <laughs> we all need forgiveness, so we should give it freely. Some of us need it more. Okay, I, I will freely admit I'm an idiot sometimes. Please forgive me. If I've offended you, I have to talk a lot. So chances of me offending you are very high. So if I offend you, please forgive me. It's not my intention. Grow up and forgive me. That is a hallmark that will separate us and make us uncommon in this world. Number three, this is one of my favorite. This is for all the people who think they're spiritual. All right, this is all for you holy, holy, holy saints of God. All right, you ready? Here we go. Forgiveness is a measurable expression of faith. You know why? Because it takes faith to forgive. You want to say, you say, I'm a person of faith. All right, will you forgive by faith? Faith in God. Let me tell you what most people do. Well, I don't want to forgive them because they'll just do it again. Faith says, I don't care. The same provision that God has for me now, he'll have for me then. Living in fear of what somebody might do to you is not faith. I got a newsflash for you. There's a good chance that that person you're mad at who keeps doing that same dumb thing doesn't have the ability to change. Just like very often, we don't. More often than not, I don't want to offend anybody. But, but I keep falling in the frailty of my flesh. I would say you'd say it's true for you as well. Functional preser preservation of unity. It's observable as evidence of love. It's a measurable expression of faith. How about this one? It is a practical sign of maturity. This is for all you mature people. If you don't forgive, you are not mature. Again, you become, as you walk closer with God, more concerned about him than you are about people. Guess what you become? You become graceful. You become merciful. Why? Because that's what you are receiving habitually from the Father. As you mature, you become functionally forgiving. You become mature. That's what maturity is. A mature person, I, I can tell you who the most spiritual one is, the one who forgives first. Can I tell you? The one who gets over it quicker. So wives and husbands, spiritual head in your home, one, they lose their cool slower and they get over it quicker. Care what you think, care how much you read your Bible or pray, whoever's doing that is the spirit, they're leading spiritually. They're the mature one in your family. But my husband, he don't read the Bible, but you lose your mind every time you don't get your way. And then you get mad and hold grudges for three days. But I pray a lot. I ain't praying the Holy Ghost. I pray in tongues. That makes me spirit. No, I don't. It makes you, makes you unintelligible to everybody else. Hopefully the Holy, God knows what you're saying because nobody else don't. That is not a hallmark of, of maturity. I didn't offend it, about 16 people in here. Well, God bless you. But listen, <laughs> forgiveness is a necessity. It will make us an ordinary. All right, I'm done. Are y'all clapping because I'm done? Stand up. Listen, man, y'all are rough. All right, let, let me give you some truth here. Let me give you some truth. You say, I don't know what you're talking about, and everything you just said is indicative of me. You need to be born again. At the core of who you are, if you're born again, you don't want to hurt anybody and you want to forgive everybody. I'm not saying that you don't struggle with that. I'm just telling you that is a viable, observable reality in your life. If you do not know Jesus Christ and you've not been born again, which means his power and provision through the Holy Spirit has come into your life and changed your want-tos, it is available in this room right now today. Your life can be different. Just like you take a plug and you plug it in and you access all the wonders available with electricity. The Holy Spirit transforming the soul of the believer is the thing that will empower your life. It'll fill that void like nothing else. The gospel is still true. And let me tell you what the key is. Here it is. Are you ready? It's deep. It's profound. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever would put their faith and their trust and their hope in what he did for all of humanity would not perish but have eternal life. I'm encouraging you, please hang everything on the hook of Jesus Christ. Repent. Ask God to forgive you for your wickedness. Turn to him and allow him to transform you. Once you've believed, we baptize 24-7. Get baptized. What is baptism? It is your first step of faith. It's the first expression of faith in what he said. Amen? Father, I ask you, Holy Spirit of the living God, help us today. 
Help us to be unordinary. Help us, God, to stand out like never before because of the the attributes of your character and your spirit and power flowing through our life. Help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, there'll be people to pray with you. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you in Starting Point or on Wednesday night.